You know, I was asked last night to say a few words and I felt I have already abused your time and your patience yesterday. I had already talked too much. And you know, I strictly limit my conferences to 25 per year. Because otherwise, I only do talking. And I get bored with myself. There's nothing worse than listening to yourself. And there's nothing worse than listening to yourself saying the same things over and over again. So that's why I'm not a preacher. Yes, I had 16 years of Jesuit education, but I didn't become a preacher. I am very clear that I want to share a few insights that maybe, maybe just be some of the right reflections for some of us at the opening of this milestone conference you're having here. And I was listening to the songs in the morning and I heard ocean and I heard wave. I hear community. And, you know, I remember Declan Kennedy who actually introduced me to your movement. Declan is a dear friend. And Margaret, of course, was a dear friend as well, Margaret Kennedy. So I know you through Declan from the very beginning. And it means I'm not new to you, but maybe I'm new to you today. But the magic of the ocean, which are some of the key words that stuck with me listening to your songs this morning, listening to the rhythm that you were bringing, is that we have to remember that mankind, humanity, was really not living off the ocean for several millions of years. It's only about four millions years ago when uh, we were covered in Europe uh, in this ice cap, and of course also in the south we were covered in this ice cap, that the center of humanity was very much sent, was in Africa. And I'm sorry to say that I don't see many Africans here. And I think you should do something about that. The center was in Africa, and when Africa started to dry out, people had to leave the forests and had to stop this hunter and gathering movement that we've put in our minds was the way we were living, and people were pushed out to the ocean. So communities started building up uh, around the Namibian coasts and around the Kenyan coasts and Tanzanian coasts, and along these coasts, people for the first time discovered seafood. The magic of seafood was that it was not hunting, gathering anymore. It was just putting your feet in the wet water and in the sand and picking up what was there. It wasn't fishing. Then we didn't invent yet how to fish. And by the way, we still haven't figured out how we should be fishing because we're pretty stupid using nets when the whales and the dolphins use air bubbles. I mean, talking about smart fishing techniques. But what happened is something magical. Humanity was pushed towards the coastal lines because there was no life in the center anymore. It was difficult to survive with the heat and the droughts. And then something magical happened because our brain started growing. Do we realize that our brain went from 500, 450 to 500 cubic centimeters to about 1 well, 1,400 cubic centimeters? In, in, in probably less than a million years because we start eating seafood? Do you know that? And do you know what's happening to our brains today? Our brains are shrinking. And this is no, this is no joke. We look at the brain size of the Neanderthaler and that was the largest size of a brain humanity has had. And that's why we today claim that they were not really humans. Our brains are shrinking, ladies and gentlemen, and this is why it's so important. We don't talk about conserving and preserving. This is why it's so important about regeneration. We have to regenerate, starting with our food. I mean, how many of you still eat seafood? And when you're eating seafood, most of the time, you're eating junk food because it's salmon that has nothing to see with the sea. I mean, salmon is as bad as GMOs and monocultures and all the things that we know of. Salmon. Salmon. 
you know, the fish that's pinky. <laughs> you know, what I just want to share with you is this, this magic of life is not that you have a sperm and an eggshell that creates new life, as we could enjoy hearing the sounds this morning from babies wanting a bit of attention. You know, the magic of life is not the sperm cell and the egg. The magic of life is that when these two unions happen, we completely cleanse the cells. Don't, let's not forget, it's a 20, 30, 40, 50 year old cell that comes from that body that is regenerating a new life that is perfectly cleansed. I mean, that's the magic of life. We're cleansing the cells when we're regenerating life through a new baby. That is so magical. We need to go through cleansing processes. Nature and biology has given us the capacity to cleanse, generating new life. And yes, there may be a little defect in the DNA here and there, but that's the exception of the rule. Most of the time, it is a pure and a fresh virgin cell that starts creating new life. And that is why regeneration is so important. I mean, we have, to stop, we have to stop and think for a moment about the food and the seafood and the iodine and the trace minerals and everything that we could get from there. I mean, we Belgians, and sorry, Brits, Dutch, and the Danes together, we ate 20,000 square kilometers of oysters in the North Sea and we never bothered replanting them. 20,000 20, square kilometers, and now we're troubled that the North Sea is a bit grayish? Of course, you know, all the filtering is gone. We ate it. I mean, can you imagine? We are still such predators and we are not able to regenerate the sea. I mean, we have to not just regenerate the forests. We have to start thinking about regenerating the sea because the sea is the mother of life. Life didn't come from the land, it came from the sea. Life depends on water. Everything we do reimagines watery circumstances from our cells to actually procreation. It all is acting as if we're still in the sea. And then I hear people talk about regenerating land and eco-villages. I'm not saying you have to set up eco-villages down in the sea. <laughs> but we have to make the sea part of our regeneration effort. Because if we're not doing that, we're missing 70% of the land space, but we're missing 99% of the volume of life. Because life is 3D in the sea. It goes 10,000 meters deep and there's life everywhere. And we are only occupying this tiny little space with a little bit of soil in it, which we're busy destroying. Busy mining. Agriculture today, ladies and gentlemen, is mining the soil. It is not extracting nutrition. So in that sense, you know, I believe it's very important we stand still and reflect on who we are. And that's what I heard this morning in the song, The Wave. I mean, we are not the waves. Don't ever become that self-assured of yourself that you think you're a wave. <coughs> we are the surfers on the waves. Life is about learning how to surf. Life is about knowing where are the waves, where are the undercurrents, where are the currents that are so big and so strong that we actually have to start noticing them and learn how to keep our equilibrium while we're surfing on them. That means we have to come at the right time at the right moment because if you're not that right second there, the moment to jump on that surf, it's gone. And you have to find a new opportunity and you have to be patient. One of the greatest gifts in life is patience. Because if we're not patient waiting for the right waves, we're not going to grow through these enormous opportunities that we have before us. Let's think about how we're learning. I hope I'm sharing some of these fresh insights that you may say, aha, oh, is that true? Really? But we are still in this phase of an absolute discovery of how we can promote life on earth. And I want to go back to the sea. Can you imagine that we as human species, we fish and we do not overfish. It's much worse than that. 
We are fishing the females with eggs and we eat them. Is there anything more barbarian? Can you imagine that I have a goat and the goat is expecting a baby and I'm taking the goat with the baby in the belly to the butcher? What do you think I am? Barbarian. But with fishes, no problem. They don't have the plushy skin. We are treating our life cycles with such a barbarian attitude that sometimes we have to stop and think and try to find a few masters who enlighten us on what is really happening here. I have started an initiative that we're trying to convert fishing with air bubbles only. And we do that in Portugal, in Peniche. And so we're learning how to start fishing the way the dolphins do it. Because the dolphins and the whales, when they want to eat, they release air bubbles. And they are so smart they can release the air bubbles of the size that only the smaller fishes come through because they're lighter. And the heavier ones with the babies in the belly, they stay down and they're not eaten. Smart, isn't it? How come we couldn't figure that out? Of course, they've been fishing for a million years. We've been fishing for 6,000 years. We're missing a bit of experience. <laughs> but to me, it's very important that unless we see how predatory we're behaving, how stupid we're sometimes behaving, it is different. It's difficult to come to conscious levels if we're not a bit more critical about who we are and how we behave and how we ensure or avoid ensuring that we promote life. Life is what makes everything tick. So that brings me to my life in Japan, where I have now spent 34 years. You know, everything we have learned is obsolete. All our diplomas have an expiration date. Don't ever think that if you have a diploma, you have knowledge. You have an entry ticket. That's it. But every single diploma has an expiration date. And the date is shortening all the time. Within that spirit of being stuck with continuously obsolete knowledge, we again need to regenerate our own knowledge all the time. And there are only two ways to do it. One is you learn from a master. But the beauty of the learning in Asia is that masters somehow always evolve, not all of them, somehow few evolve towards becoming grandmasters. And how do you become a grandmaster? You only become a grandmaster because you learn from your students. Great masters have great students. Great students will enlarge the field of knowledge and insights and reflections and philosophy to levels and depths that the master never could see. But that is the only way the master can become a grandmaster. We need to start learning from our students. If we are not evolving to the habit and the culture of learning from our students, ladies and gentlemen, we will never be grandmasters. And grandmasters, of course, have the great privilege that they will have masters who were their students. And they teach them. And only very few in life and in history will ever become those grandmasters that we revere over centuries. Because they learned from their grandmasters. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to have a humility in our life. We need to regenerate. We need to rediscover the oceans. We need to understand what is really this cleansing of life and this regenerative capacity. But in the end of the day, we need to aspire to all be teachers. Mwalimu. We need to be the teacher. The greatest title we can have is to be a teacher. And a teacher who is not just giving the wisdom, because if I only know, if I only teach what everyone knows, I mean, there's no progress. We are in need to definitely overcome that dependency on electricity. <laughs> Maybe this 
was a gentle way of the organizer to say, shut up. <laughs> But let's come together. The greatest title we can all earn in life is that we're a teacher. And the greatest ambition of a teacher is that we have done such a good job with our students that we become masters and grandmasters. But that's not because you transfer the wisdom and the knowledge. That's because you inspire. And if you're not inspiring, you can't be teaching new things. Thank you.